So now let's talk about measuring ultrasound. And this is just a brief introduction to ultrasound measurement, all of the different uh, types of information that you can get. So the first thing is, is that with ultrasound, what we're measuring is the amplitude using decibel microvolts. And what is that amplitude? We wanna see what's the decibel amplitude in microvolts. And what about the nature of the signal and what about the dynamic data, right? So we need to know more than just what the individual decibel microvolt value is. We wanna see what the pattern looks like. So there's many ways that we can characterize and quantify the, these readings. Um, so some of the words that we can use to describe what we're hearing are whether it's a continuous tone, whether it's crackly, if there's intermittent clicks and pops, or whether it's um, repetitive uh, content, right? So that's words that we can use to describe what we audibly hear when we heterodyne those ultrasound uh, signatures down into the audible range. But we can also look at it sort of statistically. We can look at the numeric values of the ultrasound. And the four that we are typically concerned with are the root mean square, the peak, the crest factor, and kurtosis. And these uh, can indicate conditions. Acquisition time for rotating equipment or rotating machinery. Remember the golden rule for measurement is the way you take the measurement determines the result. So uh, making sure that we're taking good quality data. So in this example, um, the duration of the measurement, the acquisition time is an important consideration. If you have slow moving equipment, we want to make sure that there are uh, at least three to five revolutions of the shaft. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's so that we get enough repetition to be able to get some meaningful information from the, uh, from the data that we capture. So quantifying, we want to now let's talk a little bit about what is root mean square peak and crest factor. So first thing is quantifying these sounds, we need to have a way to gather and trend data so that it provides an indication of what the nature of the faults might be instead of just using the decibel microvolt. So peak RMS and crest factor, these provide a way to describe the signals that we're seeing. So for a sine wave in the diagram below, the relationship between the three is very simple. The root mean square is between the, the center line and 0 0.707 of the height of the amplitude, or about 70, 71% of the height of the amplitude. The uh, crest factor is really the peak, where it comes to the peak of the amplitude to the RMS. So in this simple sine wave, the peak to RMS is 1.414. But this is really a very simplistic um, sine wave, right? The so sine wave is a very simplistic signal. This is more like the signal that we, we tend to see. And um, those sorts of signals, are much better represented when we start thinking about RMS peak and crest factor. <clears throat> so when we talk about RMS, the RMS value can be calculated in a number of ways, but the most common are digital and analog. Digital is where we digitize the signal and calculate it calculate the RMS value by, by those uh, signals. Analog is where the circuitry actually rectifies the voltage and makes everything positive. So 
all of the values that would be below the baseline are flipped and put onto the top of the baseline. So here's an example of what an analog signal would look like. <clears throat> and there are, um, there's different techniques uh, to do that. So that's analog. We take the bottom from below the signal that was from below that baseline and just flip it. And then we calculate the RMS that way. Somehow we missed digital. Where did digital go? There it is. Okay, so for digital, we just calculate discrete points along the signal. And then we can calculate the RMS based on that collection of digital signals. So now quantifying the sound some more, when we're looking at ultrasound signals, those signals are rarely sine waves, like I said earlier. And therefore the relationship between the calculated RMS peak and crest factor become very useful. So if we look at this time waveform, you'll see that the RMS represents the broad energy in the waveform. Um, the occasional peaks really don't have a, a much of an impact on the RMS value. Peak value, on the other hand, is the highest amplitude recorded in the sample. And it's about 1.414 times the RMS for a typical sine wave. And you'll, like I keep saying, you almost never see a sine wave in, in real life when you're collecting data. It'd be very odd to see that. And so the, when we look at the highest peak amplitudes, it could be uh, above the baseline or below the baseline, but the highest amplitude is what the peak value would be. And so if you look in this example, if there's, uh, an A value, which is say this first value that's on the upper side of, of the time waveform, or the B value that's here on the lower side. Um, when we look at those two values, it looks as though the amplitude on A is much bigger than the amplitude on B. So the peak value that gets recorded is going to be this A value. So it's simply the largest peak within the time waveform sample. Crest factor is the, it's a relationship between the peak value and the RMS ratio. Okay, so the crest value is where you take the peak and you divide it by the RMS. So measure, and this is a measure of whether at least one large peak exists. And there's general rules about this. So if the uh, peak to RMS or the crest factor is about three, it's just random noise. There's not a lot going on. If it's uh, maybe up to or just below four, that's friction is likely. And if it's greater than four, up to say 50, um, that indicates that there's impacts happening. So when you think about um, uh, ultrasound based bearing lubrication, uh, you tend to be hearing rubbing or friction in those bearings until you start applying grease. And once the grease starts getting into the bearing, that noise level drops back down. And uh, if you've not done any damage to the bearing previously, uh, the friction hasn't uh, uh, progressed to the point where there's actually defects in the bearing, uh, then that noise will drop back down to a random level. If, however, you've got um, a very severely damaged bearing, um, applying grease to it may drop it slightly, but there's still going to be impacts because of the defects in the bearing races or, or bear ball bearings. So both of these waveforms would generate uh, the same crest factor uh, if we assume that the RMS was the same value. But I think you can see uh, on the upper uh, time waveform, there's a lot more peakiness to it. And on the bottom, there's a, a periodic piece, uh, just a um, very sporadic peak. Um, so both of these waveforms would generate about the same crest factor because there's not a big influence um, based on the number of peaks. It's just the absolute value of the highest peak. So when we look at uh, crest factor, 
Um, this is what it sounds like if the crest factor was about uh, 4.07. Play it one more time. So you can hear it, it's, you know, kind of sounds like background noise. And uh, if you look at the uh, magnification of that time waveform, you don't see a lot of big peaks. Um, you see a lot of average or, or very uniform um, peaks that are shown here. But if the crest factor was to increase to, in this case, 9.89, and you'll see that the RMS is at 51 and the peak is at 70. This is what it sounds like. I'm going to play it again. Listen really closely. See if you can hear the little pops and clicks in there. One more time. There's a little bit there that you can hear, right? And so now if you explode this time waveform, you start seeing that there's quite a bit more peaks uh, in this time waveform. So you can see how that sound changes. How about if the crest factor goes to 12.73? Let me know if you can hear more of those pops and crackles. Sounds different than the, the one previous or the two previous, right? Now let's um, look at quantifying the sound with RMS peak and crest factor. Um, so here's some combined ways to look at it. Um, if, you're, if you've not really worked with frequencies before, amplitude, right, increases the amount over uh, on both sides of the baseline. And as I'm moving this around, notice the RMS peak to peak and peak values are changing, but the crest factor and kurtosis are not changing at all. So if I leave that about there, now if I start increasing, now let's say that there are impacts that are happening within that time waveform. Notice as I increase the spikes, the crest factor and kurtosis change quite a lot. RMS changes uh, somewhat, but the peak to peak and the peak values aren't really changing, right? You can see how that works. So now can you see more clearly, I've just uh, increased the size of this a little bit. And again, if I'm moving the spikes, we're getting a lot more changes in the crest factor and kurtosis. And a little bit in the RMS, not so much in the peak to peak. Okay. But changing the amplitude changes a lot with the RMS and peak values. So peak values are pretty important when it comes to bearing defects. So bearing defects generate spikes of vibration um, or increases in the ultrasound and the detection of the peak amplitude and thus the, the use of crest factor are all very helpful for bearing defects. And in this animation, you see where the red dot is at the, the six o'clock position on the bearing. If there was a spall in that location, Every time one of the balls passes over that spall, it's generating an impact. And remember early on, we talked about ultrasound is really good for friction, impacts, and turbulence. So impacts are uh, definite defects in that bearing. Uh, we need to talk a little bit about uh, the amount of measurement time. Uh, how long are you going to record the time waveform? And so uh, when you're using an ultrasound device, um, initially you can, you can just be scanning with it and not recording. You're just listening. Um, but then when you hear something or if you're trying to trend bearing wear uh, or bearing defects, um, you want to attach the um, 
uh, the sensor, you want to put the sensor on the right location, and then you want to record the sound so that it can later be analyzed. You can listen to it and see if it changes over time, whether it's by audible hearing of the uh, pops and cracks and so forth, or whether you're doing the diagnostics using um, RMS, Peak, and, and um, Crest Factor. So the challenge is that we want to make sure that we're, we are collecting data for a long enough period of time. So in this, you'll see two data windows. Um, and if you tried to compare these two, they look kind of like they're off of different machines. Uh, but it's just that the amount of data that was collected wasn't long enough to capture all of the problems or all of the noise or ultrasound um, that that machine was generating. Um, so what we want to do is be able to collect a long enough window of time that we are able to generate uh, representative results of the true health of that piece of equipment.